Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's great to see you on a Sunday morning. It's great to be here as we come together to worship our God. I don't know about you guys, but uh, it's great to be here. It's been a busy week. It's been a bit crazy. We're going to uh, invite Jeremy to come up and get ready to uh, do some singing. Uh, well, we actually can't sing, but he's going to uh, lead us in some songs. I don't know about you guys, but I'm still getting used to uh, the world of COVID and what we can and can't do. And it's taking a little bit of adjusting to, uh, to get used to, but it's great to be here uh, and see, uh, see your faces. And we especially welcome those that may be at home, uh, maybe in their pyjamas still this morning, or having some toast or coffee or whatever. We miss you and we look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. But before I hand over to Jeremy, I might just open in prayer. Dear God, we thank you that we're in your house and we pray that as we come to worship you today, Lord, that uh, our hearts and minds will be focused on glorifying you. We pray that your spirit will be with us this morning. And as we uh, read your word and as we listen to uh, Jeremy lead us in, in singing, Lord, that we'll just get a chance to reflect on what worship truly means. And not just on a Sunday, but how we do that through the week, Lord. Our life is meant to, to be a, a, a symbol of worshipping you and glorifying your name both here and out in the world, Lord. And we pray that you'll give us the, the strength to proclaim your name in the world that needs to hear your voice. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Awesome. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all feeling today? Great. Feeling great? Awesome. Um, so if you were here last Sunday, um, Cam spoke a little bit in the, uh, in the morning service and Aaron in the PM service, if you were there, just about what we're doing with worship moving forward over the next little while. And... Because we are actually unable to sing, which is a bit unfortunate, um, we actually do have the opportunity to, to reflect and to praise and glorify God in, in other ways. And one way which we were exploring last week was actually to give an offering to God, um, however, however that may look like in your life. So that could be any type of fears, any type of um, you know, pride, anything that is in your life that you can actually say, God, I actually want to surrender to you right now. I want to glorify you with it. And this morning, um, I'm actually going to read a passage, and I'm going to sing a song based on the passage. And this is a, a verse and passage which uh, Moses actually prayed. Um, it's a blessing over the Israelites, but it can be definitely a blessing and, and a prayer for the church today, and this church in particular today. Um, from Numbers 6 verse 24, it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And for me, that's just a really powerful passage where there's a, there's a God there who loves us, who wants to bless us, who does bless us, has given us every single good thing in our lives that we've ever experienced and every good thing that we will ever experience. And this morning, we have the opportunity to actually um, take consideration of what God's given us and actually give that back to him. So I'm going to sing a song that actually um, has the lyrics of that passage which we just read out. And while we sing, while I sing for the next five to ten minutes, I want you guys to um, to quietly in, in your heart and in your mind as well to actually just surrender things to God. Say thank you, God, for the things that I have, whether it be your family, career opportunities. God, thank you that we can have a relationship with you. Thank you that we can glorify you, even though it looks a little bit different. Because the truth is, is that God doesn't look at you know, how good your singing voice is when we sing. He doesn't look at any of the acts that we do, but he does look at your heart. So we have some time this morning to actually focus our hearts on Jesus, focus our hearts on God and give him glory in this time right now together as a church community. So I'm going to sing this song. And as I do, I, I really hope and pray that you guys can just reflect on him, maybe thank him for things, maybe surrender parts of your life to him and glorify him. So let's spend some, spend some time with him.
We just give you all the glory and the praise, Father. We know that every single good thing and every single blessing has come from you. And this morning, Father, we just give it back to you. We pray that you help us to just see your heart, to know your heart, to understand more of your love and truth. And today, God, we just want to give you all the glory for that. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. You are so beautiful, God. You are so holy. Help us to focus on you. Help us to use our lives to give, give you glory, God. Guys, just a couple more moments to just respond to the glory and the, respond to the blessings that God has given you. challenges I've been facing in this new world of COVID is how we greet people. So, you know, quite often uh, it's the handshake, you go to put the hand out and then you can pull back and the common one is the elbow. We all do the elbow. Come on. This is exercise. Sunday morning, come on, you people. Are you with me or what? Let's go. Exercise. Do the flap, the chicken flap. You may notice that when I preach, sometimes I go like this. That's because I'm getting used to doing this. So we do that and then there's the foot pump. Come on. Oh, the foot pump. Come on, Steve, you can actually move, mate. The foot pump. That's it, the foot pump. What else is there? What other ways are there to greet people? The high five. Julie, where's Julie? She's somewhere. High five. There she is. The high five. The peace. Hey, good to see you. The nod. The, the air hug. Is that what you're doing? The air hug. What other ways can we greet people? Oh, nice one. Did you see that one? You might have to stand up. I'm going to put you in the spotlight. <laughs> What else? Some of the younger people have been doing this one where you, you come up and you lean forward and you bring your foot up and you grab the person's ankle. You seen that one? I think if I do that, I might fall over. But so it could be no H&S risks. So I don't want to do that because Steve may go mad at me. Or I may pull a hammy or, or a back injury or something like that. But there's, like worship, there's many different ways that we can greet people. And uh, it's just different. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just different. And thank you, Jeremy, for... for uh, leading us in that this morning. So what's happening in the, in the life of the church is a few things. Um, the first thing, um, or one of the things, is I just want to uh, reflect, uh, or reflect, we thank everybody for responding uh, to the reflection and prayer uh, re questions that we sent out to help the leadership reflect on, uh, I guess, what we've learned as we've been in a, a, a unique period. And as we look to come out of that, what does church and, and what does our community look like? And so we thank you for all those responses. We've got them. We're praying over them. We've collected them. Uh, it's been a, a, a bigger task than what I thought it would be, just putting it all together. Um, and so we can prayerfully look at it and understand maybe where God's taking us in a different 
uh, way and maybe through a different season. So just be uh, praying for us as we consider that and we will come back to you as soon as we can in relation to what are the core things that come out and the things we need to think about and pray about. So in the church life there's a few things. I'm just going to quickly... Uh, oh, it's working. Look at that. So welcome. COVID. So we have a plan in place. It's, uh, as you'll see all the, the uh, posters around, there's hand sanitizer, there's all special things that you need to be aware of. We've got you sitting apart. And one of the things I was thinking about this morning was, you know, normally when I come to church, I'd probably be sitting here somewhere. And then, you know, Peter Brake would be sitting at the back corner and, and uh, there'd be, you know, Dave and Julie Guy would be over here and the kids would be over here or over here. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, church at the moment means that we, we get moved around a bit and we're not sitting in our comfort zone, which is also a good thing, I think, in lots of ways. And COVID is the same thing. We've just got procedures that we've got to go through and uh, take care of each other in that journey. What's, what's happening? Galatians. So um, not next week. So next week, uh, Steve is, is preaching. Uh, and Aaron Brown's preaching this morning. Um, so that'll start uh, in two weeks, two weeks' time, I think, Galatians. Oh, youth group. How good is it to have a youth group that's going great? And that's led by Jeremy and his team, and they're going really great. I think uh, I saw some pictures um, on Facebook where they were all here doing this dance, foot dance tap thing on Friday night. Um, I recognised Jeremy because he had this really long hair. I thought, who's that young lady? And then I realised it was Jeremy. Sorry, brother. NBC, I can say that because I'm his father-in-law, right? But uh, NBC Church Camp is coming up. Great opportunity for us as a, as a church community just to go away and relax and encourage you to book in for that. Um, so it's at a different time. It's on a normal long week, uh, normal weekend uh, in October and 1st of November. Now, during uh, uh, COVID, we've had quite a number of babies added to our uh, family. Uh, and this is uh, Tobias Ivan Cowley, um, who uh, is Brent and Amy Cowley's little baby boy. Uh, and I think they're at church tonight. I think I saw them on the, on the register for the night. So it'd be great to see them. Um, they're all going well. He's a beautiful baby. He's got all this dark hair and uh, looks, looks fantastic. And go, they're all going well. I think that's it. So what else happened during the weekend is soccer started. Church soccer started. Woo! Yeah, we're all going. Who's, who's playing in the soccer teams? The three over there. Right. Good on you, Bob. You're still going. So how did the... How did... Uh, I can't... I don't know what grades they are, but what... Have, six, third and six. Both teams won. Both teams won. So we are thankful for that. And we, yeah, we are grateful for that. Any injuries? Just you. <laughs> Are you, you still in goals, brother? I am. Oh, good on you. Good on you. I love it. Can't get past Bob. So uh, there was that. And also the men went forward driving yesterday. If you look out in the car park, you'll see some dirty cars. So uh, I don't know why you haven't cleaned it since yesterday, Ken. But uh, I think I know, here's Steve went through the car wash. <laughs> Steve went through the car wash. But uh, if you want to go out and ride on Ken's windows uh, after church, or a bit of water. Okay. Okay. That's why I didn't come. I didn't want to get my car dirty. But uh, it was a, I believe it was a great opportunity for the men just to connect and uh, to share some time together. So what have I missed? I don't think I've missed anything. I'm going to hand over to Aaron. I'm going to invite Aaron to uh, to come on up. Um, and the collection plate is at the back. Um, so as as per part of the COVID, the collection plate we can't pass around. So that's at the back. So please. Um, if you feel led and you've come prepared, uh, that's there. Uh, also, as you leave today, um, we will be there. Will be out on where you come in. There will be a register for next week. So if you want to get in early and pre-book your seats, uh, you can do so. Uh, and we'd encourage early bird discount. Thank you, Aaron. Aaron's always got the quick pump. And uh, so those are the things we just encourage you to, to uh, get in back into some patterns and thinking about it. So I'll hand over to you, brother. Thank you. Okay. Good to see everyone. Hello to everyone. We're still watching at home at the moment as well. 
Uh, I was going to turn up in my PJs because uh, that was one of, I think, the upsides of uh, during this time is getting to do church in your pyjamas. So who thinks we should do a pyjama day maybe here at church? I mean, I'm assuming anyone without their hands up, it's because they don't wear pyjamas to bed, probably. But uh, anyway. All right, uh, so let me pray and we'll, uh, we'll get into the word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for another week that we can look back and, uh, and celebrate your goodness. Lord, thank you that uh, as we get to come together, whether we're, we're here in person, whether we're still watching online at home, Father, Lord, I thank you that we are all part of your body. Uh, Lord, that we are all your children, and Lord, thank you that uh, you have helped keep us safe this week. Uh, Lord, as we delve into your word this morning and, and take a look at um, how you want us to live and, and other ways that we can worship you with our life, Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be with us, that, Lord, uh, my words that I share will be, Lord, your words that you want people to hear. And, Lord, uh, even beyond anything I say, I pray that you'll speak to people's hearts this morning. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. Well, we have been exploring a bit about uh, what worship looks like, uh, specifically around when we come here on a Sunday. But uh, I wanted to kind of take a look at perhaps what worship might look, for our, look like for us during the week. Uh, in one particular area. And uh, so I'm looking at how does God want us to live? And uh, we're taking a look at the book of Micah. Now, if you uh, hear that I'm talking about the book of Micah, there's probably one particular verse that stands out to a lot of people, Micah 6, 8. And we're going to take a look at that in just a moment. But before we do, we need to get a bit of context. So the book of Micah is a book by uh, the prophet Micah. He was one of God's uh, prophets, and he was speaking out to uh, the Israelites in a time when they were really very far from living how God wanted them to live. They had fallen into corruption. Uh, The leadership in the place were basically using their power and resources to make themselves even more powerful and uh, even wealthier and were not treating those uh, below them very well. Those who were poor were getting treated even worse. And even at the time, even other prophets and other people who were meant to be God's people were not living as God would have them live. In fact, uh, for many of them, they kind of had, uh, I guess, their their hands reaching out to those who were rich and powerful and kind of uh, sucking up to them a bit to kind of keep their own positions of authority as, you know, sort of the religious elite at the time. So this nation of Israel, who'd been given very clear instructions from God through the Ten Commandments and uh, a bunch of the other laws that, uh, that were in their books as well, were living so far from being who God had wanted them to be as a nation. So Micah steps into this situation, and his job as a prophet is to speak what's on God's heart to the people and to call them out. So the entire book of Micah, and it's uh, it's not a huge long book, so if you want to read it more thoroughly, you know, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, Not right now, if you can pay attention to this, that'd be great. (laughs) But if you look, if you want to uh, read during the week, you can. But it's interesting because when you read it, the book is a mixture of both being a really kind of harsh, uh, I won't say judgmental, but calling out judgment on the nation of Israel. And yet it's also balanced with this hope and this uh, optimism for, I guess, who God's people could actually be. Uh, It's one of those books where, as we said, there's like one verse in particular that we all tend to quote. There's not a lot of others that people necessarily quote because they sound pretty harsh. He's, He's got some pretty strong words for God's people at the time. But as I said, it's a balance. He calls them out on how they are living, but also reminds them that God is a merciful and loving God who is a God of redemption. So as we said, the most famous uh, verse in Micah is Micah 6, 8. And um, I'll put up, this is Micah 6, 6 to 8, because I want to give a bit of context before we get to the verse everyone knows. But of course, Micah 6 8 has uh, been a verse that has helped spawn many ministries, including the Micah Challenge here in Australia that was birthed out of uh, some of the social justice work that the Baptist churches were doing here in Australia. 
And uh, I actually remember that there was a, a big wave of social justice that moved through the church, probably about 15 years ago. Now, of course, the church has always been involved in helping people, and uh, there's always been a social justice component to how the church has, uh, has lived out its calling. But I remember particularly 15 years ago, it felt like there was a change. There was something where there was a, a bigger push for us as churches to get involved in social justice on a bigger level beyond just running a few smaller ministries, maybe out of individual churches. And uh, I remember for me personally, it was a bit of a, uh, a challenge. Oh, I'm going to switch. There we go. I remember for me, it was a bit of a challenge at the time because I think growing up in the church, my understanding of what it meant to be a, a good Christian and live a good life as God would want us to live was kind of more centred around my own personal morality or issues about what I did in my own private life. So, you know, as a teenager, it was kind of like the things that were basically drilled into me about what it meant to be a good Christian teenager were safe sex for marriage, don't get drunk, and try not to swear. <laughs> Those are, you know, oh, and read your Bible and pray and try and tell as many people about Jesus as you can. And uh, I don't know if anyone else kind of, for a while, maybe that was sort of the, the bulk of what, uh, what living out the Christian life looked like. But uh, for me, that was sort of the centre of it. That was what I was mostly focused on. But then there was this challenge about 15 years ago where we were being told as the church, or we as the church were even saying, hey, maybe there's uh, more to living out the gospel than just those things. Not that, they, not that our own personal morality or um, you know, living pure lives isn't important, but that it isn't the only part of living out a Christian life. So anyway, so we look at this. Now, there were criticisms of the social justice movement at the time. Um, there have been since as well, where perhaps some people have sort of looked and gone, has the church become too much about just doing good works and not focusing enough on issues of personal morality. But I think there needs to be a balance between the two. Because if we are to look at the life of Jesus, it is absolutely impossible to read the Gospels without seeing that the way he lived his life was a balance between how he kept himself pure and encouraged others to do the same, but also how he loved and reached out to others, how he fought for the oppressed, how he brought mercy to those who were suffering, how he reached out and touched the leper, despite the fact that the law actually at the time said that that would make him impure. We know, I'm sure, you know, there are plenty of examples you could bring to your own mind of times that Jesus was living out this gospel about helping others and having mercy for others. One of my favourites is the, is the woman caught in adultery where they all go to stone her. And I love, again, that balance. And we looked at it, um, I can't remember how many years ago it was now. I think it was January um, <laughs> during COVID when we were looking at uh, the uh, Daniel Dilemma. That seems so long ago now, doesn't it? It's crazy. But we were looking at that balance of truth and grace. And, uh, and I think for me that always has summed it up that, you know, Jesus was someone who told her, hey, you are no longer condemned. You are free to go. He saved her from being stoned, but then said, hey, go and sin no more. And it was that balance of not just him. Because he had every right. He could have still called her out. She had been caught in adultery. She wasn't an innocent person. She wasn't a blameless. Come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, the reason I didn't just include the last bit is because I think when we look at it in context, we see that he is responding to, when he is calling out the nation of Israel, that uh, he is saying, you know, there's all these ways that people could repent and worship God. And uh, we see a whole list of them where they're being sacrifices and, you know, about olive oil and 
giving up our firstborn, which depending what kind of mood my daughter's in, I understand that. <laughs> I would never want to do that. Um, but he is saying there is another way that we can show worship and honour to our God. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So let's have a look at uh, those three things. So we start with act justly. So what does it mean to be just? I think we all probably have a fair idea of what that looks like. To be just, or even the idea of justice, I think most of us understand that it's almost like you know, that image that we see of justice is normally uh, a balancing of scales. It's about fairness, it's about uh, making sure that people are getting what they deserve. That can both mean that if someone has been wronged, that they get something that helps right that wrong. The other way around, of course, is we have our justice system, where people who uh, have committed a crime get the punishment that they deserve. So I think we all understand what the idea of, uh, of justice or uh, that what it looks like. But when it's termed here, act justly, it's also kind of talking about how we act more than necessarily about a whole system or anything else. It's a command for us to make sure that in all we do, we are acting with the idea of justice in mind. That there is a fairness and an equality in how we're treating others. And I think when uh, we all want justice for ourselves, I don't think anyone here has a problem with that idea. Yep, I want my uh, justice for myself. But do we seek justice for others? Even when it costs us. I think that uh, when we look at the political landscape, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of movement within the church to make sure that we as, uh, as the church are being protected at the moment. I think uh, there's a, and rightly so, there's a lot of push to make sure that we are um, you know, being protected by freedom of religion laws, freedom of speech laws, a whole bunch of different areas where we are, as a church, moving as, a, uh, or, you know, as the wider church, saying, hey, we want justice to make sure we are getting what we are entitled to. But I think that it can't be the only thing that we're fighting for when it comes to justice. We need to also be people who are fighting for justice for others as well. Now, sometimes justice costs us. And um, this is probably the best way to illustrate this is if you've ever had a fight with your partner. Who here has fought with their partner recently? <laughs> <laughs> Liz and I had a doozy the other night. The stupid thing was, it was actually about us both wanting to be really generous. <laughs> it was the stupidest thing to be fighting over. But, <laughs> but as I'm sure we've all had a fight with someone we care deeply about. But there, there comes a moment, and stereotypically and probably truthfully, it usually comes to the man, that moment where you realise, I'm wrong. And in that moment, you have a choice. You can either continue arguing, or you can stop and go, actually, you're correct, and I'm sorry. I'll be honest, probably for a lot of my life, I would go the debate route. I love a good debate. I love being able to pick out a way to bring an argument down. But over, you know... Well, really just uh, even before being married, but having to learn that it's not about winning the argument, it's actually about getting to what is right and what is true is more important. And that might cost me my pride to be able to go, you know what, I'm going to take a step back here and say, you were right, I'm sorry. Now, on a bigger scale, justice may sometimes cost us. We've seen that with the Royal Commission. The reality is, is that in many churches, wrong things were done. Not, it wasn't the majority of the church, but an injustice was done. And we, as the church, the wider church, right across our region, had to put our hands up, right across the nation, had to put our hands up and say, we were wrong to, uh, to allow these things that happened. And uh, now it's costing the churches. 
monetarily. But I think it's a good thing that we're able to put up our hands and show a society around us that is looking for people of integrity and for us to be able to go, we, we, we acknowledge the wrongs and we're here to help make them right. Sometimes in the, uh, the verse, uh, you may hear people when they talk about Micah 6, 8. So it says, act justly. That's most translations do that. Some say do justice. Others say seek justice. And what I like about some of the ways that, uh, that that kind of speaks is that whilst act justly speaks to us and our own personal lives and how we interact with others, do justice and seek justice is almost this proactive idea that it's not just that when opportunities are before us that we make sure we do the right thing, but that we actually look for opportunities to bring justice into the world around us. So it's an encouragement in our own lives then. Are we acting justly? Are we treating those around us fairly? That can be on a small scale, whether it's those arguments we have. Um, Liz challenged me the other day. Uh, we, we bought uh, something off Gumtree. And my the first thing I went to do, as I um, am prone to do, is offer the person $10 less than what they're asking. And Liz kind of challenged me on it. And she's like, why did you do that? And I'm like, because that's how Gumtree works. You... You put a price on there that you know people are going to ask for a lesser thing. And, um, but she said, but why did you have to ask? Like, were you not happy to pay that price? And I, and, and I was kind of challenged because I'm like, but it's Gumtree. <laughs> That's how it works. But she was talking about the fact that, well, you know, it was only a $10 difference. If the original price was something I was able to pay, that I could pay, and that if they weren't willing to negotiate on, would I still purchase it for that amount? I would. Why not just honour them, if I can, by paying the full amount? We had this conversation after I'd already uh, got the ten dollars off, so sadly, <laughs> I didn't get to live that one out. But it's got me thinking. Next time I'm on Gum Tree, you know, not that I won't ever negotiate things, but you know, am I just trying to get what I can for myself, or am I willing to, even though it might cost me a little bit, actually look out for the best interests of someone else? So let's move on to love mercy. Now, my understanding of mercy was probably shaped by a couple of things growing up. One of them was the game mercy. Has anyone ever played that? It's, it usually takes the form, it, it often happens between siblings, and it uh, usually takes the form of either interlocking hands with someone and just trying to wrestle them or squeeze them, or you might do it as a handshake where you shake hands and you just squeeze each other's hands. And the idea is that you're trying to inflict pain on the other person until one of you cries out, mercy. Anyone played that game? I just see a few, I think it must be a few of us younger people. And Ken. (laughs) But my understanding of mercy was this idea of power and domination and then having a a kindness of relief for the person below me, which is not too far off what mercy is. But that was my, uh, my, my first understanding of the concept of mercy. Some other images that might come up when we hear mercy might be more around the idea of, say, a judge having mercy on someone who has committed a crime and saying, instead of me throwing the, the full, um, you know, the full book at you, that will give you the full sentence, Um, I'll, you know, only give you this much. I see that you've been good or, you know, whatever the situation might be. We might see it in more of the justice system that that might be our image. In fact, in the Bible, we're given this parable of uh, the unforgiving servant or the unmerciful servant about uh, a, a king who has someone come to him and says uh, he has all these debts and he's like, by all rights, I should be putting you in jail and he begs for mercy and he says, please, please, uh, I'll I'll pay it off. Give me more time. Uh, Let me uh, just have some mercy on me and I'll be able to uh, give you what, you know, what I owe you. And then, of course, the story goes on that he goes out and then he finds someone who owes him money and he says to him, hey, give me all the money you owe me now 
And that guy begs him for mercy and says, no, please, you know, you don't understand this and that. I'll pay you back. I just need more time. Show me mercy. And he basically says, no, and has him thrown in jail. Then, of course, the parable is that the king hears about what happens and says, I showed you mercy. You didn't show others mercy. So now I'm going to take everything that I owe and you're in jail. And you can find that in Matthew 18, 21 to 35, if you want to read that and not just hear the Aaron paraphrase. So those are some of the images of mercy that might pop into our heads. But most of us are not in the position of being a judge or a king. So how does this uh, concept apply to us? Well, the concept of mercy is basically to treat with compassion and kindness those who we are positioned above. Now, you might be thinking, am I positioned above anyone? Of course, there's some uh, pretty obvious examples of where that might be. If you are a leader of some sort, whether it's uh, within the church or within an organisation, if you're in a political place of power, if you run a business. Obviously, in the workplace, there are generally hierarchies. And uh, how do you treat those who are below you? But then there's also social positioning as well, or social status. Uh, I think for most people here at the church, you know, we, we've heard of like there's upper class, middle class, lower class. I think that for most of us, we're probably considered in the, the middle to upper class. And socially speaking, it is possible that we may, there may be others who are considered below us in that kind of mindset. What are our attitudes and how do we treat those who are below us? Mercy can be defined as kindness and compassion. Now, there's this word that has been used a lot lately and it may cause some people to kind of go, oh, when they hear it. And it's the word privilege. Who's heard that word being used a lot recently? few people. And it's a bit of a hard word to talk about sometimes because at the moment it's kind of being used almost as a weapon in some ways. Uh, it can make people feel guilty. But privilege is basically where you are in a position that means you are better off than others, but not through anything that you have done or earned, but simply because of how you were born whether that's the kind of family you were born into, the colour of your skin, um, the, the country or the type of society that you were born into. Now, privilege in and of itself is not a bad word, can I just say. In fact, usually when you hear, you know, if you say, oh, it's a privilege to do this, or if it's a privilege to do that, it is a positive word. And uh, we as a society, like a greater society, are going through this phase at the moment where we're coming to understand the differences in uh, equality throughout society and it's a messy, tricky issue. And uh, sometimes for those of us who have perhaps been a bit higher up on the ladder, it can be a bit uncomfortable to have to face the idea that maybe some of the good things we have have come at the expense of others who haven't had it quite so good. But I want to kind of challenge that if you've heard the word privilege and you've kind of now reacted negatively to it, that actually the idea of acknowledging privilege has been a part of Christian life since the beginning. I was thinking about it in this context. Whenever we say grace over a meal, you know that most of the time what we say is we thank God for his provision in our lives. Um, I very rarely, I don't think I've ever prayed a grace around Lord, said, Lord, Thank you that I'm the one who gave me everything I've got. We are normally acknowledging that blessings come from him. And there is a humility in that that reminds us that, you know what, we are thankful for what we have and acknowledge and are grateful for what we have because we acknowledge that there is a God who has given that to us. And I think in the same way, we can approach our lives with that same kind of humility of being able to go, you know what, it's not necessarily bad or wrong that I have the thing, the good things that I have in my life, but when we have the humility to go that acknowledge that it is a blessing, it frees us up to bless others with it. 
And it takes away a sense of entitlement that like, no, I'm going to hold on to everything I've got because I deserve all of this. And that's not to take away from the fact that many of us work hard to get the things that we have. But I think it's about keeping that balance of acknowledging that for many of us, we have been able to succeed because we were able to have good educations where maybe others weren't able to. That perhaps for some of us, we were born into families that where we had a bit more money than other people had to help us get ahead in life. And that humility helps us to be able to love others and help those who don't have the same kind of access that we may have had. It's interesting that mercy is also considered a spiritual gift. If you've ever done one of those spiritual gifts survey things, that uh, mercy is actually considered a spiritual gift. Some people have it a bit more than others. Doesn't mean we get out of it if we like, oh, it's not one of my spiritual gifts. Don't have to worry about that. But for some people, and I'm sure there'll be many people within our church who actually have this gift, mercy is a spiritual gift. It means that we're almost without even thinking, your first response is to look out for those who are suffering. I don't know if has anyone here done a test and had mercy as one of their spiritual gifts? There you go. Sorry? It wasn't yours. Okay. Don't go to Bob if you're looking for mercy. Okay. The reality is, despite any spiritual gift, we're all still called to do these things. But some people have it as, and perhaps that's you in your life. And I, and I know within our church, it's a strong thing that our church has that we are looking out for those who are suffering. Um, yeah. So justice versus mercy. It could seem like these two concepts could be at odds. Because justice talks about getting what is deserved, but mercy kind of talks about giving people relief from the things that are happening to them. That image of a judge having mercy on someone who has done wrong, well, that looks less like justice and more like mercy. So are these two things at odds? Does seeking to make the wrongs right always line up with having compassion and forgiveness for people. Well, I think what helps us put them in perspective and keep the balance right is that it's all about how we treat others. We need to be seeking justice for others. I think even beyond our own justice. Making sure that we treat those around us fairly and how they deserve to be treated. We also need to make sure that mercy is about us giving mercy to others. But I love that it also says, it says we are to love mercy. That is not just to act it out, but to actually appreciate what mercy is because we have been shown mercy. In Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, i.e. mercy, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And there are plenty of other verses as well that talk about this idea of forgiveness where it always brings it back to, don't forget you were forgiven. When, you, when we're being called out to act kindly to others, to show love to others, we are always reminded that it comes from the place and the fact that we have first already been shown that same mercy and kindness and forgiveness. And that brings us to walk humbly. See, it is impossible, I believe, to truly act just and to have true mercy without having humility. This is because pride gets in the way of justice. Uh, I said it before when talking about on those smaller scales when we have a fight with those we love. What's the thing that stops us saying you were right and I was wrong? Pride. 
when we start to look at issues within our society and we are starting to seek justice, the things that we find most hard, I think, to support are when it may look bad for us. It's very easy to want to fight for justice when it can actually make us look good. You know, we're helping champion someone else and their problems that has nothing to do with us. But it can be harder when we're facing our own things that we have a part in, whether it's us personally or us as a society or a culture. And humility drives, it fuels mercy. Because humility reminds us, as we just mentioned, that we are no more deserving of love and kindness than anyone else, and yet we have received it. It helps us to be able to look at people and instead of judging them and saying, well, they're in that position because of their own choices, which in many cases may be true, but humility allows us to go, but for the grace of God, you know, there goes I, there go I. You can fix the grammar in your own minds. Humility allows us to empathise with others, which allows us to show love for them. We acknowledge that we too are sinners, and it allows us to own our own part in the injustices in the world. Also, people are drawn to humility, and people tend to trust the message of a humble person. So if we're to bring this message of God's love and his forgiveness and his redemption, people are more likely to listen to a humble people than a proud people. There's an amazing message and an amazing book uh, by John Dixon, uh, a great guy from Sydney, who did a whole study on humility. And when did humility become a virtue? Because in the ancient world, humility was actually seen as like a weakness, Yet I think we can all agree that as a society, we now actually lift humility up as a virtue. And he actually did a historical research, and the turning point was the cross of Jesus. That was actually the turning point within the Roman world where it was all about pride and position and status for the person who was meant to be the leader and the, of a group of people and the son of God to be hanging on a cross. That was the turning point where people said, Perhaps humility is a higher virtue. It's a great book. You should read it sometime. It's called Humilitas, by the way. Humility allows us to sit and listen. Uh, My wife coined a really cool term uh, one time when she was preaching on the book of Job. And it's this concept of sitting in the dust. Dust or dirt? Dirt. Sitting in the dirt. There you go, dirt sounds messier, so that's good. Sitting in the dirt. Humility allows us to go and sit with those who are hurting in their moment of mourning. And there's a whole message that we could do on the book of Job and how we respond to others suffering and uh, people who are having a hard time, but... I'll just say that humility allows us to sit in the dirt with them. It's interesting how these three principles we're talking about here very much reflect when Jesus condensed the the message of the gospel down to, and it's our mission statement here as a church. What is it? Love God, love others, make disciples. The discipleship part, not so much covered here, told testament before You know, Micah even knew there was a Jesus. But it very much reflects how Jesus communicated the gospel. Love God, love others. I think by doing that, you'll draw people to us so that we can make disciples. So what does it mean for us moving forward? Good news, guys, we're nearly at the end. (laughs) Well, I think first of all, we need to check our personal attitudes and behaviours. Hopefully every message you ever hear here allows us to take a moment to do that. Have we been acting justly in our own lives? Have we been making sure that we are people of integrity in how we do our business dealings? 
How have we been treating people that we've been put in positions over? Whether that's in a workplace, whether that's even as parents. I, I haven't yet to face this, but I imagine there's going to be some tough times where I'm going to be telling my daughter that she is wrong and then I'll have to acknowledge that maybe she was right about something. <laughs> what about ourselves within society? If we are fairly well off, how do we, what are our attitudes and how do we treat those who are not as well off as we are? Whether it's for their own, their own actions or whether it's because of the society that they were born into. Some other ways that we can start to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly is to get involved with some social justice or mercy ministries. There's some fantastic ones, uh, even through the Baptist Church, there's Baptist World Aid. You might have a compassion sponsor child or two. Uh, there are many other organisations, World Vision. Maybe there's some more specific things around specific projects like providing clean water. Uh, maybe it's even within Australia. I heard um, Tim Costello once share, uh, it was at a, co a conferencing that he was doing, and I asked the question, I was sort of like, what was, you know, how do you balance that thing? And he said, uh, of where you invest your time and money. And, uh, and he said there are, he likes to do it on three levels. There's an international, a national, and a local level. And that, because, you know, often the arguments come like, why are we focusing on overseas when we've got problems in our own backyard and vice versa. But the reality is that there are ways that we can be involved in bringing justice on all levels. And I think it's important that we get involved on an international level, whether that's through a sponsor child or supporting an aid organisation. On a national level, maybe it's about facing some issues that we hear in society, in our Australian society that we can speak into, whether it's through our vote or whether it's through supporting organisations who are fighting for the rights of, uh, of people who are doing it tough, or maybe even an organisation like the Salvos who are helping people out. And locally, of course, there are many great local things that might be supporting the work that this church is doing in reaching people. Maybe God has birthed something, an idea in you that is yet to be played out. Maybe there's a new ministry here at the church that you are being called to do to help those who are suffering. Of course, mercy ministries, ministries that help people in hard times as well. Not just fighting for justice, but just being there for people. Places like, uh, I know we're involved with the women's shelter that help victims of domestic violence. And uh, I'm sure if you talk to Nicole, there'll be some great opportunities to get involved and support that work. Even honestly, even just, and we do, I pat on the back to all of you guys. You guys do this amazingly. When someone's doing it tough and we just make meals, that's an act of mercy. And I was talking to, um, to the, one of our families here just the other day, and he was saying how amazing it was just that they received meals. So the, the Pascos, um, Jace was saying how amazing it was that it, uh, when Leah's father passed that you guys all stepped up and were able to give food to them at that time and, and support them. They felt really loved. We can repent. This is the hard part. It's easy to do some good things, but it also requires us sometimes to stop and just say, I'm sorry, God, that I've sometimes been ignoring the problems or maybe even contributed to the problems. It's not about getting caught up in guilt. It's not about shame. It's just about sometimes in order to move forward and do what's right, we have to acknowledge what's been wrong. We can check our attitudes when it comes to responding to current social issues. But it'd be interesting if you think about what your response to hearing about George Floyd's death and, and the responses to that in America, what has been our reaction to it? Has it been one of wanting to see justice happen? Is it one of feeling a sense of mercy towards those who are suffering at the moment? And I will just say, if you are wanting to stand and support a community of people who are hurting, 
It's great. And I know for many people, they've perhaps been struggling with the idea of, well, I don't want to use the hashtag Black Lives Matter because there's a lot more complicated things with that. Uh, I know some people would prefer to use, like, All Lives Matter. Um, I think the main thing is that we need to be able to be able to say, there are people hurting, can I stand with them? What the answer to this situation? Well, it's an American problem, to be honest. So there's not a lot other than, you know, showing our support that we can do. But it's interesting watching the range of responses that have come out. I've seen everything from people, uh, obviously, you know, we've seen the rioting. And can I just say, that's not good. I don't think anyone thinks that rioting and looting is a good thing. Um, that's also not been the bulk of the responses, it's been the bulk of what's been reported on because it's more newsworthy than um, the rest of the protests going on. But online I've seen peop- uh, everything from people saying, yeah, burn it all down, to there's no problem, why are people complaining? Uh, you know, the, s- the statistics say blah, 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 and we need to stop complaining about it. They're kind of like the two extremes I've seen, and I think there's room in the middle to be able to show love, acknowledge that there is an issue and there is a problem and that there are people hurting. What that solution is, I don't know. I'm not an expert. And again, it's maybe not for us to necessarily speak into because it's about America, not about us. But it's interesting that issues like this, and there'll be others that come along, I think it tests what is our heart attitude towards living out Micah 6.8. Um, I wrestled a lot with that because I wanted to post something, but I didn't know what to post. Um, I wanted to share my support, but I didn't necessarily want to get caught up in this political stuff that has gone on because of it. But I think that we are called to, to speak out when there is injustice and to show love to those who are suffering. And I think it's important too that we do realise that whilst this is a a different culture, America is a different culture to Australia, that some of those similar kind of issues do happen here. And uh, the solutions will be different, how that acts out and why is different. But I think at the moment it's highlighting that we don't live in a perfect society. So it is our part as Christians in making our society a bit better. So we're going to finish with a time of prayer now. Um, We haven't had a lot of opportunities to do things corporately. We can't sing together at the moment. But there are absolutely no restrictions on us praying, apart from perhaps laying hands on. So I thought we'd uh, finish with a a time of worship through prayer. A couple of things I think it would be good to pray for. Pray for America right now. They are divided and they're hurting. I think they need our prayers. We can pray for them for unity, for justice, for mercy, and for humility. That justice will be served, that there'll be mercy for those who need it, but that also as a nation that there can be a humility in how they approach it. Because there's a lot of ego going around in politics at the moment overseas. And we can pray for us. And by us, I mean here in Australia. We can pray that the issues that uh, perhaps we're facing as a nation, whether they're obvious at the moment or not, that we can uh, be an active part in, uh, in changing our society for good. So what I thought, how I thought we'd do it is uh, I might pray to begin with, but I just want to open it up that if anyone just feels led to pray, just pray out loud. Um, if you want to just pray to, not to yourself, obviously I'm praying to God, but if you just want to pray inside your own head, that's fine as well. But if, if you feel led to, to maybe just share a quick prayer or a long prayer, if that's what you're led to as well, just speak up. There won't be, I won't pass the microphone around. We're a small space so we can just pray and we'll be able to hear. So let's take some time to pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that we love because you first loved us. Lord, we thank you that we understand justice because, Lord, you are the God of justice. That we understand mercy because we are the recipients of your mercy through what you did on the cross. Lord, help us to be people who 
who do justice. Help us to be people who love mercy. And Lord, help us to walk humbly. Lord, I personally want to repent of the thing, times in my life where I've been a part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Lord, I thank you that your grace and your love means that you don't hold condemnation over me. There is no shame. But Lord, you give me the strength to hopefully do some good in this world. Lord, I pray that you help us to be people who are able to work as one, united, to uh, show the world what love means. That balance of not just being pure, godly people, but people who live that out within our society and make a difference. Lord, help us to have humility in how we approach things. Not arrogance, because we understand, Lord, that we, we were sinners too, and in many cases still are sinners, except that we're covered by your grace. Well, thank you for your goodness. And highlight to us, Lord, the ways that we can seek justice, the ways that we can love mercy, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for Aaron's uh, message from, from you this morning. And Father, for, for me personally, I pray for forgiveness for anything um, that I may have done that may have offended or caused person, personal grief to be. that has lost its way. Lord, we're in a world that is full of confusion and full of uncertainty of the future. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that through all this, Lord, you're in control. Lord, you know the future. And Lord, nothing happens without your full knowledge. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that you love us individually, you love us corporately, you love us as a nation, you love us as a world. Lord, we just look to you and put our faith and trust in you, Lord that no matter what, no matter what we go, or what we do, or who we meet, what we say, Lord, that we will be witnesses for you. We will speak out on your behalf, Lord. We will show mercy to others. We will show humility. We will show kindness. Lord, let us be a church that forever reaches to the society that we, that we are all in contact with during the week and on the weekends, Lord, as people come. As we, as we come together slowly, Lord, as the, as the world renews its passion and renews its normality, Lord. Lord, let us, let us just remember this time of difficulty and how easy it was to fall into this situation. And Lord, how easy uh, that the uncertainty and the un and things that can happen to us have just turned us completely on our head. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you were there amongst us. You were there, Lord, through this whole event, Lord, and you have got your controlling hand. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for the blessing of living in Australia. And Father, we pray for our beautiful nation that you will, <clears throat> Lord, turn hearts back to you. Father, we pray for our leader. We thank you for Scott Morrison and we really believe that he is your man for us um, at this time. And we lift him up to you and pray, Father God, that you will strengthen him that you will uh, refresh and renew him, Father, that you will give him your wisdom, mm. your insight, your discernment, your courage, mm. all that he needs, Father, to lead this nation. Thank you that he acknowledges you and he belongs to you and you have given him to us uh, to lead us at this <coughs> very difficult time. Mm. So we lift him up to you, Father, and his family and ask that you keep them all safe and protect them, Father, and uh, use that man, Father, to bring this nation um, 
and the God, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Lord, we, uh, we lift up our brothers and sisters in America, Father. Lord, a nation that claims to be one nation under God, indivisible, Lord, is looking divided and honestly looking at times very far from you. But Lord, we pray that, Lord, this might be a time of renewal and blessing for them. That, Lord, they may come to a greater understanding of the need for you in their lives. Uh, Lord, Recently, their Vice President, Mike Pence, said that, uh, that their army was the biggest force for good in the world. But Lord, we pray that that might be the church, that it might be the church that becomes known as the biggest force for good. Lord, we pray for unity amongst their people, Lord. We pray for reconciliation as they sort through the, uh, the injustices that have been a, a long part of their history. Lord, we pray that there can be humility on both sides compassion on both sides and Lord a desire for them to come together as one truly under you Father and Lord we pray for the own issues here in our own backyard Lord that are just starting to at times come to the surface perhaps because of this stuff or for other reasons Lord but I pray again Lord that we as the church can be the greatest force for good in our society that we too can have an attitude of humility and, uh, and to reconcile with those that have been hurt. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you for the cross and what it means for us as individuals. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Awesome. All right, so we might invite Jez up to finish with the song. <coughs> Thanks a lot for that, Aaron. Um, so many great thoughts and so much wisdom in that, in that passage that we explored there. Um, so I'm going to finish this morning's service on a song, and this is a song um, which I've written called Where You Are. It's a song that I'd like us to reflect on, and it's just a song about um, being where God is and fighting for the things that God wants to fight for. Um, it's a song about you know not wanting to move, not wanting to speak or act, without God being there in, in that moment. Um, so I hope that this song can minister to you guys and that, um, that you can get something from it as well.